I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today, I'm here with Julie Holly. Julie, I'm very excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, my gosh. I've already had so much fun. It feels like a little bit like Disneyland, you know? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've been talking about superheroes and everything, which I guess uh, makes sense with my background. But Julie's the founder of Three Keys Investment. Um, she helps people find freedom through multifamily real estate investing and uh, is also has her own her own uh, amazing podcast. So, Julie, I'm just going to open it up to you. I'd love for you to tell the listeners your background, kind of a bit about yourself and, and how you got started in real estate. Well, I appreciate that question. And I think it's a question we hear on a lot of podcasts and we we're all curious, right? Isn't that part of the human condition is like, we're curious about the other people in the room. I mean, you go to a cocktail party or something, everybody is looking around the room. Like what, what's their backstory? What, how, why are they, why are they like that? How did they get there? So I, I really appreciate that question because how we arrive anywhere in life it's all usually very similar with a few, a few rainbow flecks. If you ever read the book, rainbow fish, sure. when your kids were little. Yeah. Um, so I, I do have this interesting part where I'm third generation in real estate. So you can imagine my company is three keys investments. There's a reason there are lots of reasons why it's three, but that third generation in real estate is really interesting. Cause I grew up in residential real estate sales and so I experienced like that high and low, the feast and the famine. And I felt the economy. Um, I am an empath. So I was very connected already. I didn't know that there was a name for that back then when I was a kid. <laughs> I've learned that. But it's like, yeah. I was always very acutely aware of what was going on with the economy, with real estate, even when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. And so I had this natural a cumin that was building just around real estate by nature of that, but I didn't choose to go into real estate. I chose to become a public school educator. I thought I'm going to leave a life of legacy and meaning and purpose and contribution, which is important to me by going and serving in the public school sector. And I love kids. So that was a really great win. Bonus. I was also thinking I'll be able to rock climb all the time, have all the adventure I want. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and meanwhile, I'll have this like pension building up in the background. And then my third year of teaching, I was going to be tenured. They started handing out pink slips. And I'm like, what the heck? Uh, this is a government job. I'm not supposed to get laid off. I am supposed to like be here for X amount of years, retire and just, you know, enjoy the rest of my life having adventure. And that, that pink slip, just having that, I didn't even receive one, Jason, but just knowing that that was an option and that yeah. I could actually be put on the chopping block, sobered that 24, 25 year old girl real fast. I'm like, <gasps> Someone else can call the shots for my life. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody listening right now just had like, uh, we call it in, in some teacher buddies. We have our, our bubble in our head of all the words that you're not supposed to say in front of children. Everybody's <laughs> bubble just popped. I just, yeah. I know it. Right. Because yeah. once you realize almost like red pill, blue pill matrix style, right. Once you realize like you're not in control and someone can direct the course of your life. Um, you, you make a choice to either say, uh, heck no, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the captain of my ship or eh, whatever. And you're copacetic and you're fine. And I wasn't. So I went into residential real estate sales and I thought, this is great. I'm making a ton of money. I really don't like who I am. <laughs> I'm making a ridiculous amount of money. I am wildly successful for someone who was went from teacher income to, commission-based uh, real estate sales. And honestly, it wasn't fulfilling and there was a disconnect, but there weren't podcasts and I didn't have books. I, there were books, but I, I just didn't have the access and the resources to the type of life that I wanted 
And I had already house hacked. So I had bought my first house and completely gutted it. There was like rat feces around the perimeter. I, it was so scary. I had to wear a mask and I'm like in there with a shot vac. It's like, like <laughs> sucking all sorts of stuff up. <laughs> You're just like, I was so grimy and gross, but you know, we got it done and it was beautiful. I had a roommate for the first time, did that, did all of that. So I'm starting to feel some of that. Like a lot of people do, you know, maybe if I can just build up, I can go back into education, which I did. And I'm like, you know what? I was a better, I think I'm a better human as a teacher. <laughs> I don't think that there's some words that are describing how I'm becoming and I don't want to, I don't want to do that. And I don't know how to avoid that. So let me go down this other path. Let me get back into education and let me just, my head, I was, I got married and I'm, we're like, Hey, we'll just buy houses that we can live in off of one income. And then we'll just keep them and rent them out. And we'll just, do, we'll just go that route. And that's what we started to do. But what happens when you have kids? That what, gets harder. It, it gets so much harder. And then, so we had our second child, our, our amazing daughter. And that's really when everything like hit the fan. I was like, okay, I'm, I manage. And I was at home with the kids at this point. And I'm like managing this stuff and it's totally fine. But I felt so vulnerable. And I wasn't sleeping at night. And I have a very fierce sleep at night policy. I have literally recently walked away from a deal. I withdrew from a deal, which is not, a, it is not something that is um, common. It's not something that you do. Like if you commit to a deal, if you launch a deal, you stick with the deal. I had actually launched a deal with another group. And for some reason, unbeknownst to me, I started to like not sleep at night. This is how fierce my policy is. I'm like, okay, I went through the check, right? Okay. Is this deal? Like, is this just fear? Is this nerves? Is this, okay. It's not any of that. I've never felt this before. I don't know what's going on. I withdrew from the deal. I ended up finding out that the deal fell apart. I had no indication why, but so I'm like very much like if I'm not sleeping at night, so I'm not sleeping at night as we have our second child, and I'm like, this isn't comfortable. If something happens, even though we have reserves, something could happen and we could lose everything. And I, you know, a little bit mom-ish, you know, moms get a little, <laughs> let's just be real. I can say it. Most people can't, but I am a mom. So like when you have kids, you, you know, there's this whole different element for moms that comes out and I felt too vulnerable. So we back, we, we exited that space and we're sitting on this Capitol and I'm like, just sitting there. That's me hitting my fingers on my desk right now. Cause I'm like, I can't stand this money sitting in the bank. <laughs> and so it was driving me batty. I was presenting ideas to my husband. And finally he's like, listen, you figure out what you want to invest in and, and then present it. Like, we'll go for it. We have a lot of good mutual respect on that. And so that's when I found syndication. And then the rest, boom, is history. It's like, okay, I drank the Kool-Aid. I saw this path that just made so much sense to me. And I have not deviated from that. And it was, for me, it was this whole convergence of my entire background coming into harmony. It was like, okay, you were an educator and you love to serve people. Well, you want to educate your investors and you want to serve them. You want to put them first and you love real estate and architecture and making things, you know, improving things. And you've done that, but now you get to do it on a bigger scale. It, it's just, it's a win-win for everybody. And it makes my heart super duper happy. Yeah. That's, I love this story. Cause I feel like I heard about 10 things that we can talk about and I want to back up to and, and kind of pick apart on the story, but, um, right back to being third generation, uh, in real estate. So most, you probably have the same thing, like on your podcast, most, most of my guests come from some totally random outside of real estate thing and then find their way in, but you, mm-hmm. you're third generation. So what, in what capacity, what, what, what was your family doing in real estate? Yeah. Residential sales. Okay. So it's completely different. Now here's the thing that really bummed me out is that 
commercials, you know, commercial brokers would be in the same office. So, so they were, um, a, uh, started out as a century 21 and then converted into Coldwell Banker, which if y'all know anything about residential or those brokerages, they are related. It's part of the empire. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's another tier on top of it, kind of like Gap, Banana Republic, Old Navy, that right. sisterhood. So, so anyhow, I grew up there in that setting. And when I went into sales, I would sit beside commercial brokers. How the heck did nobody tell, how was this not being preached at those, you know, at our weekly meetings? Like, Hey, um, I've got this great opportunity. You can, you know, like, yeah. Hey, this is how you, there could have been so much more education. Interesting. My husband, we have a Remax brokerage. So we okay. own a Remax brokerage in our small town and he has stayed in the residential space. Um, which is completely great. But I went to the brokers convention in Austin, Texas, um, a couple of years ago or last year. And it was amazing how many brokers didn't understand how beneficial, you know, they're just in the residential space. And I was trying to, to explain to them, this is how this is going to benefit this type of investment will benefit you. This is why your age, the agents in your office need to be you know, in the know on how this is going to benefit them because the benefits for residential agents, not to go off on it too, too much, but like the benefits for residential agents are through the roof. So particularly yeah. if they have that, they have real estate professional status. Yes. It's like, so <laughs> yeah. come on so people. <laughs> yeah. They've got, they've got tax benefits that, that uh, a, a lot of people can't, a lot of passive investors cannot access. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a, mm -hmm. uh, we've that's a that's a big uh it's kind of a fun tangent to go off on because it's a it's a big one to me because my background I'm I'm a veterinary surgeon that's my sort of day job outside of real estate and so I I really can't use my depreciation like all the all the K1s that I get in I can't really use those because I don't have real estate professional status at this point so that's one of my big goals is to to figure that out so if you're yeah if you're if you're in an office full of residential real estate agents, they need to know that they need to know that that's, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a way for them to, to essentially really kind of minimize or eliminate their, the, the tax burden that they have. So that's a, that's a huge deal for them. Um, asterisks. Let's throw an asterisk on there in order to have real estate, professional real estate status though, they actually have to have one asset that they manage themselves and it can't mm -hmm. be rented to grandma Sue. Right. right. It has to be. Right. So I always tell people, just pick up a small duplex, you know, then you've got two doors, you know, offset that one door, you know, headache that you don't want to ever have in your life. Never, never, never have that headache. Um, and so, but, but if they have to, they do have to have something that they are an active investor in. Yeah. 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 It, it's yeah. Not to have like a tax discussion here, but, right. but it's true. It's, it's a very <laughs> powerful tool that can be used by certain professions more than others. I guess I would, I would say we can, we can leave it at that. Um, yeah. but you just, I mean, you brought up another point too. You're in, you're in the office with the commercial brokers and in like, I have, I, I never, I was never a, a real estate broker of any type, but I have wondered in this space, why don't those commercial brokers just buy all the deals? Like I don't, you're the ones with first access. So I don't even think, I don't necessarily think it was like anyone trying to not talk about it. I think some of them aren't aware of, of how benefit, you know, they, there's that, you touched on it earlier, like sort of that job, you know, com whether it's commission or, or salary based, like that job mindset of where I'm going to have the, you know, safety of this money coming in, or that's the, or the entrepreneur mindset of you're like, how can I, how can I maximize whatever I'm doing Mm -hmm. from an income standpoint and and minimize it from an effort standpoint, right? Like that's, the, that's kind of the balance that you're trying to strike. And I don't, so I have often wondered why people in the space, like the, the commercial brokers, maybe the property managers and some property managers do own as well, but it's like, there's a lot of these vendors that have very early access to the deal and get to see them at a very deep level. And I would think, why? what are you doing? Like, what are you waiting for? You have, it's in your hand first. You, you have the opportunity to, to make these deals 
work. And I know there's, uh, there's a lot of different reasons for it, but I, I think your point about, you know, you're sitting in the office with them and nobody told you this is, is I, I, I'm just not, I, I'm struck by how it's not more talked about more, more sort of promoted, I guess, which is, which is our job. And you as a, as an educator at heart, I think is, <laughs> it's obviously something that's very, very important to you. Yeah. And, and I think that to that point, like they can get the way I understand it. And I was recently speaking at a, at a conference and a young broker. So he's very new. And he, I said, well, he, he said, I will bring you the deals, but I won't participate in the syndication because it's bad form for me to, in his opinion, it's bad form for me to take all the good deals in a sense and to participate in them because now people are, are going to think I, they're getting sloppy seconds when a deal comes their way. Yeah. Cause I've already poached the good things. So, so there's a little bit of that, but to educate as a broker, to educate the people, um, you know, commercial broker, like educate the people around you so that they're empowered. And now, now you have your pool of people that are going to just straight up buy from you. <laughs> right. Right. And they're not, I'm not saying I, I understand that, you know, sort of conflict of interest. Yeah. They can't necessarily just do it within their own deals, but they know other brokers. They know like they're in the business. It wouldn't be hard for them to access these opportunities and be, you know, very active in the, in the investing space as well as the sales space. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I don't know. It, it's it's yeah. We could talk for hours about you know why some people like the the sort of job structure and why some people like you know being an entrepreneur and and the perceived safety or lack of safety on either side. Like it's just mm-hmm. kind of. I, I think you pointed out you know another thing you you said in your story is is people started to get laid off as in your job as a teacher and it's like. I don't, I don't think people think about that. People don't really think about the fact that they might lose their job, right? They're like, this is my safety, safety net. And then when someone does lose a job or get laid off, it's like they were completely blindsided, even though it happens all the time. Like, Mm -hmm. and when the economy is good, it doesn't happen frequently, but like when it's not good, I mean, the spring of 2020, a whole lot of people lost their jobs. Like no one was no one was safe in their job at that point. Like I, I didn't get laid off, but I had the same concern that you did where I thought this could happen. Like I could really lose my job and I don't have control of that. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's very much a, a, I think a, a control ownership gives you control, right? So if you yeah. own the business or you own real estate that's providing you with passive income or or active income, whatever it is, like the ownership gives you control of how your life looks going forward. Yeah. And it's so easy just for us to become conditioned, you know, and to get into habits and routines and routines are helpful. They, it benefits our mind. Our mind creates all of these streamlined pathways to keep us on a path, on a trajectory mm-hmm. just because it's easy and more efficient in our, for our energy and everything. But then we have to, we have to raise the, our consciousness to that and to say, Hey, wait, hold on. Is this actually the best path for me to be on? And how do I mitigate the risk of this path? And not that we can always look at a crystal ball and say, here's what's going to happen. But hey, if I'm going to be putting money into a 401k and feeding that, basically feeding a stock portfolio, or if I'm consciously saying, oh, I'm going to divert part of that over here into passive real estate investments. And it's a now we're just raising our awareness. And now something happens it looks a lot different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's just a, I think the being conscious of it, the awareness, like that's, that's it. You just need to know when you're working in a job and you're, you know, sort of putting into your 401k and I'm not even saying these are bad things. Like it's just, it's a different approach. Maybe it's, I mean, it's approach that I had for a long time. It's just, (laughs) I'm starting to, to change that my awareness and my approach. And it's, you can stay in in a in a w2 job there's lots of great jobs we need people to have jobs like i i love what i do as a surgeon and it's but you you have to i think you have to actively participate in what your financial future looks like there's just 
that's it right there. Yeah. Like you can't be disengaged from it. And we're at a, we're at a point in history uh, globally. And, and for me, middle age, like that creates this whole other dynamic where it's like, I need to be really way, uh, very conscientious about what does this look like? What does my future look like? Because I remember, oh, wait, I remember people, you know, losing everything and having to work longer. I, you know, we saw people just lose a whole bunch of their retirement on the stocks this year, just months ago, mm -hmm. where it's like, same exact scenario. And it's kind of like, how many times do we have to play the same record? It's a broken record. Yeah. Like, be diversified. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not about, we have to do all, all or nothing, but just being really raising that awareness and, and, um, be being conscientious about where we're placing our capital so that we can gain the upside on everything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's hundred percent, right. The, the, if you, if you look at, you know, the last year or even the last four to six months that, that you mentioned, it's like, if I look at did whatever, there's a lot of fear out there, right? There's people are worried about interest rates. People are worried about the market, all of that. But if I look at what has actually happened is my stock portfolio has dropped by 30 to 40%, but my real estate continues to go up. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it, it's not going up as fast as it was. And it's maybe not as valuable as it was like four months ago, but it's still going up. Right. And it's not, I don't, I don't now have to restart it. 30% less in, in, you know, the real estate world. So it's just, it it's awareness is, is perfect. It perfect. You know, your, your, uh, your podcast, the conscious investor like that, that's exactly what you need to be. You need to know what you're, what you're doing and why, and like what works in what scenarios, because it's fine to be in stocks. There's no problem with that. It's just you, there are other potentially better options i don't i don't even know like without saying that it's better i believe that it's better to invest in real estate but but regardless being in different you know asset classes however you want to look at that i think is is a good idea it is full disclosure i don't have any stocks right now <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, like, I, I wish I didn't. Of, I, right I, now, like, I wish I did. <laughs> I just kind of, and I my uh, my financial planner wasn't very happy with me. <laughs> he was like, "You're really going really all in into this real estate thing. You're putting all your eggs in a basket." Meanwhile, I now live on a hobby farm and have a bunch of chickens, and understand that expression, having all your eggs in one basket, because <laughs> you fall on right. your eggs, right. you lose them all, all of that. But I'm like. I have not regretted the real estate. I just got a distribution in, I noticed in my bank account from, you know, passive investment. I'm like, yeah, I like this. This works really well. And I can actually access this money. This isn't like tied to my 401k or something. I have control over this money. Granted, I have some self-directed funds that I cannot touch and everything, but it's like, great, this is real money. And I've been telling a lot of my investors the, one of the elements I'm loving about, uh, you know, the passive investment space, granted I'm an active investor, but I am also passive is like, I am getting money and my investors are getting money in real time at whatever the money value is valuation is right. So I think yeah. you're going to put your money in the bank. You're going to be losing because of depreciation. You put your money into an apartment complex, like the one that you guys have, you know, available right now. It's like, great. You put your money into that, consider it putting it into another bank and it's going to give you these distributions along the way. And those distributions aren't going to really swing your tax bracket around. So you got the comfort there and it's going to be coming at whatever inflation is, it's coming at out to you. Think of an ATM like, Oh, here, <laughs> and it comes out at that valuation. Right. What other investment is going to do that for you where you can actually use the money in a practical way, it's not so much money that it's going to get, you know, deteriorate because of inflation, but it's going to be the right amount of money for you to maybe take that trip or do whatever you need on your house. Or it's, mm -hmm. I just feel like it's just right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and as you're getting those distributions, the value of your money that's still in there is going up. Thank you. Taking it full circle that I've totally left that out. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's like just, it's growing, growing, growing. <laughs> right. If you take that money out of the bank, that's worth less because of inflation. You have less money in the bank. But as you get these distributions, you know, if, if you say, 
you put a hundred or you put a hundred thousand dollars into a into a uh, a syndication say it has a, an eight percent preferred return so you're getting eight thousand dollars in that year well you still have a hundred thousand dollars in that yeah. and the value it's- of that asset your per- your percentage of ownership of that asset is increasing so when it sells you got that money along the way and you're still you're still going to get you know participate in that sales proceed so it's it's a Obviously, you and I both believe in <laughs> the syndication model very much, and it's just a matter of, I think, truly education and, and sort of spreading the word. Because I did a few years ago, I didn't know what it was. I wouldn't have, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have known. I had someone, a friend of mine, ask me about. It was a a, a minerals um, fund syndication. Ooh. I didn't know anything about it, and I was like, mm, no, I don't understand this, and I might still make the same decision decision because I don't understand minerals. But I also didn't know it was a syndication. And so I didn't know until later and went sort of went back to him. And I was like, hey, you might want to tell people like what, (laughs) like explain (laughs) what this is, because I might have been more inclined to take part in it had I known how how it all works. I just didn't really understand the process. So (laughs) it's on us to to do that, to do that, you know, education and and, um informing people of what's available and, and how it all works and how it looks. Um, mm-hmm. You, you said you, you did some house hacking, you did some live in flips, right? So you're kind of doing mm-hmm. all of that on the residential side. I did the same thing. I kind of, I didn't call it house hacking then. It was just like, I can't pay the mortgage by myself. So I'll get a roommate kind of thing. <laughs> was, Mine was, was I have, I'm on a teacher's salary and now I have this mortgage payment on my own. I want to be able to go do something adventurous. Let me get somebody else to help. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. It's just that it's Same like, thing. well, okay, I need either I get two jobs or I get a roommate. Like that was, it was kind of the <laughs> option. So, so yeah, I think a lot of people do that. They come from that. And, and then you sort of backed your way or backed your way out of that. But then when you got back mm-hmm. into real estate, you were, it was at the the syndication level. So, so tell us about that. Tell us a little bit about, you know, when you decided to go with commercial syndication, like how did you make those steps? How did that, how did that become available to you? And what did it look like? Once I heard apartment syndication and it, I mean, like literally I would say I have a faith testimony of my salvation. And I have a real estate testimony of when I like made my conversion, my conversion moment to from residential to commercial. Literally, I could like visualize every element driving to the gym, listening to bigger pockets, hearing money calm. Like this whole thing is very tangible to me because it was so pivotal, completely 180 for my trajectory. And the interesting thing, Jason, about that is that it just opened the rabbit hole. So now I knew just like some people get into short-term rentals or self-storage They're like, whatever niche you find, you end up, you, there's so much more information available. So then I started feasting on Michael Blanc's podcast because there weren't that many podcasts available. Mm -hmm. And and then credible podcasts with credible guests. Turns out I ended up having a bunch of guests that I had heard on Michael Blanc's podcast come onto my podcast when I launched it a few years ago. (laughs) Um, All that that to say is like, I went down that rabbit hole, tons of education and just honestly bought Michael Blanc's book because there weren't a bunch of books out there and just followed it like step-by-step. I'm like, okay, great do this, check, do this, check, get a website, get a LLC, get your business cards, you know, do, I mean, I just was like, treated it like a, a, you know, this is the the checklist. The instruction manual. It is. (laughs) And so, so that was a task. However, I am very hesitant about taking people's money. And that was all I want to do is serve investors. I knew that from the very get go. I'm like, all I want to do is educate and support investors and create a really phenomenal investor experience. And in doing so, I figure, how can I best do that? If I don't, if I'm just talking the talk, but I have not done this, then how can I actually really enthusiastically say, this is the way come along. So I, I took a first, my first year of investing was investing in myself and in doing everything on my own. So I put money and I was in a forum recently. I speak on this all the time at conferences. And then I, I made a comment recently in a forum where people are like, 
mentorship programs are a waste of time. Don't put all your money into this, blah, blah, blah. And I, (laughs) but I actually invested in a mentorship program and it is an investment. And I took part of our seed money and I invested into a program that offered me like a like-minded community access to a mentor. It gave me access to high performance coaching. It was like, and every single one of those things opened up the next, the next level to me. So, um, so I took that whole year of invest. Okay. I'm going to invest in me, my knowledge into my community. I'm going to invest passively. So I understand what that's like to wire money. I'm going to roll funds, but you know, into self-directed funds so that I understand what that process is actually like. So I went down all these rabbit holes myself, because I really think that there are a lot of well-intended and um, active investors that are seeking passive investors who want to, who say, do this, do this, do this, but they've never experienced it or done it themselves. And there is, I mean, come on, when you watch, you know, when you watch Batman in the movie theater on an IMAX screen, you come out a little bit changed. You're like, wow, that was like a surreal experience, right? So you can't, like an experience cannot, is worth its weight in gold. And so I can speak from a different level of experience. And, and that was painful. Honestly, it's very painful when you take an entire year to just invest and learn and grow. And I saw people take making steps and taking strides and I stuck to my convictions. I thought this is no different than college. I, I want to make sure I can when people invest with me that I am following through, if I ever lost their money, I would not sleep at night another day until they got their money back. So I'm like, I I just want to avoid that. Let me just keep sleep at night policy. But I don't know about you, but comparison is a real thing. And that was one of my biggest challenges. And, and I'm going to tell everybody listening, it doesn't go away. (laughs) It's like you do your first deal and you're happy about your first deal, but your sphere and your network grows and the people that I am around are so much further than I am. And I just want to be like them that there's this gap. And so I always have to keep that in check is to like, enjoy the journey. This is a process. They didn't get there overnight. Just, you know, like do what's right, do it with excellence and let everything fall into place. But that I have to continually remind myself of because otherwise um, I would, I would just be bummed out and probably quit. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll never catch up to them. <laughs> right. I had, right. I a hundred percent agree. And you, you, you just struck, you, you can't, you'll never catch up. It's not, and that shouldn't be your goal, right? You're not, you should, exactly. you're not trying to catch up because you're not also going to jump in a time machine and move the, however amount of much amount of time they are ahead of you. So it's, uh, I deal with that a lot too. Like I've had the same thing and it's like, I used to, I, I did the same thing, like reading all the, um, reading all the books, listening to the podcast, Michael Blanc's podcast. And I would be, I was always drawn to the people that were like, Oh, they have so many hundreds or thousands of doors in six months or something like that. I'd just be like, that's amazing. So fast. You can do it this fast. And I, and then it didn't happen for me. And it was like really pretty crushing <laughs> to to be like, well, what, I guess I'm not as good as that person or what, you know what I mean? Like that just, yeah. and it's not, you do, you really do have to look at it from, from a process standpoint and not from a, you know, it's good to have goals, right? It's good to have goals, but, but the process has to be a part of those goals. And and I think sometimes when you're starting out, it gets, it gets too easy to set unrealistic expectations on yourself because someone else is ahead of you right and it's like mm-hmm. you don't know you don't know what their network was you don't know what you, you don't know all that went into it you also don't know like maybe they just worked at it more like maybe and they what had, did they sacrifice right, right so maybe. for me right now it is i'm in summer mode <laughs> i would say i'm like yeah. this is summer julie and <laughs> my kids are around and right. i am present but my hours are clearer and you know what i'm gonna go spend the afternoon with my kids and I'm going. And so I consciously say, this is a choice and I am choosing to invest in my kids. And that 
by nature of that, that means that I am going to go a little bit slower. I am going to have to be choosy about how I'm spending my time and where I'm putting it. And if I'm okay with that, I'm okay. And I can't get a time machine and come back to my kids, but I can build a business. And once they're gone, I'll have all the time in the world to build a business, but (laughs) I won't have the time to get back with them. You said, you said something about goals and I have actually been transitioning my concept of goals into vision and Mm -hmm. transitioning that over, I think is really powerful because, um, goals can be very seen. They're very isolated. Like you get to the finish line and then a lot of people feel empty or incomplete or now what, but when we create a vision for our life and what we want, just generally it continues to, it continuously evolves with us Mm -hmm. and invites so much more curiosity and wonder and opportunity versus here's the, here's the finish line. And so within that vision, there can be like the goals of like, okay, well, you know, someday I want to have 60 acres and I want to be able to have yurts and camp pads and RV pads and things like that for people to come stay on a working farm. Like seriously, it's one of my visions I have for my life. So obviously there are going to be some steps to get to that, but it's not the end, you know, it's like, there's so much more that comes along with it. So I think that's a great, great opportunity for people to invite wonder into their life because we've been taught to have goals and Mm. they're a destination, but when we have a vision, it's a process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. It's, it's, and I had the same, the same thing is like, we're going to, I'm going to transition here because I think this is a perfect segue. We'll talk about your why, but like my, what you just said about spending the time with the kids. Like when I started, I I set like truly like numerical goals, right? It's like, I want this number of units, this, this number of passive income, all of this stuff. And it wasn't happening quickly. And I was giving up really all of my time. And I was like, mm. I had, I really had to step back and be like, when I started this whole thing, the reason this podcast is called the Know Your Why podcast is because of my kids, because I want to spend time with my family. And so if I'm sacrificing that all along the way to reach some number that I basically just picked out of thin air, it doesn't, that doesn't get me what I want. It doesn't accomplish that vision that you're speaking of. Like it, it, there has to be some focus and some, you know, uh, management of time and and everything because I don't want it to take 60 years but still like I want to be there with my kids when 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 they're young so I I I totally understand what you're saying I totally agree with that that maybe it is going to take us a little bit longer than it might take someone who's you know 25 and has no family and they're just they can put all Mm -hmm. their time into it and awesome good for them like that's it's just a wherever you're at in your life stage and and so that's why as you mentioned, like you can't be comparing it yourself to other, other people along the way and trying to, you know, catch wherever they're at. But, um, like I said, let me use that to transition to the questions. And I'll ask you, uh, first question I always ask every guest is, is what is your, why, what, what's your motivation at this point, Julie? People. That is my why. My family is not my why. I, I think my family is my moral and ethical responsibility and something I naturally am going to fight for and take care of and everything. But my greater why is really reaching and impacting the lives of so many other people. I was in real estate. I didn't know about this. And it is, I believe, I believe this act, this investment opportunity in, you know, through syndications and certain funds, um, is going to be the difference for our generation in particular, as we get older to be able to provide for ourselves. So I really see this as more of a, um, mission, tactical mission to make sure people understand so that they're not, you know, 65 and thinking they're going to retire and they just lost everything because there was another crash or this or that happened. But they actually understand and are consciously aware of how their money is coming and flowing in and out of their lives. Yeah. No, I love that. I think that's, that has also become a part of my why in in specifically, I mean, anybody, but like specifically in the veterinary community, it's like, I want, I want to sort of spread this message, let them know what's available. Like you, you don't have to work 
80 hours a week for the rest of your life. So like it, it doesn't have to be that way. So it's a, it's a, it's that stuff. Um, I'm, I feel like it at least has been, uh, evolving, you know, kind of how I, how I feel this, this, wh what my why is, what my mission is all of that. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, tell us something about yourself that maybe isn't common knowledge, a special skill, a hobby, um, just something to let listeners know you a little more. Well, we already mentioned that I love mountain biking and that is actually very common knowledge because I post mountain biking stuff regularly. <laughs> um, but I say less common knowledge. I don't know. I'm pretty open on my life on social media. So I'm like, oh, people who check me out probably people, know most of my life already. People know all about you. <laughs> people, people know. However, right now my husband is um, having a great midlife awakening that involves craft cocktails and it is my favorite <laughs> favorite part of my life you know like it's so much fun watching him transition and, ev and evolve as a human and then also to be able to enjoy a byproduct of all these right. great cocktails that he's making <laughs> right right that's <laughs> you're you're getting to to uh live vicariously through his his i like midlife awakening that's a better better than uh midlife crisis that most people no, it's not a crisis at all just right, like no. teenagers are not rebellious That's teenagers right. are just figuring things it's out just yeah it's just a different stage of life yep um when people want to reach you how to how, how would you like them to reach out to you um head on over use the back door if you like you can head over to julieholly.com i consider you know you've heard me so if you like me and you're like i want to know more about julie and what what her company offers. I have a lot of different things going on, which is very fascinating. So you go to julieholly.com and you can access our investment company, Three Keys Investments. You can access the Conscious Investor Podcast and you can access um, the book club that I facilitate. Um, and so I also high performance coach and we're launching uh, in September, we're launching a, I don't usually do this, but we're launching a women's specific um uh, group coaching session for high performance coaching. And I'm really excited about that. Awesome. So lots of cool, Sounds lots amazing. of, lots of cool things. I just love impacting lives and helping people truly find their freedom and coaching really helps with that. And everything feeds hand in hand into each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, final question for you. What is one piece of advice and I'll sort of let you finish the sentence. One piece of advice you would give to someone starting out. It doesn't even specifically have to be in yeah. investing. Yeah. I think anytime you're starting out with anything, give yourself permission to be you and give yourself permission to grow. And anytime we are growing, it will get messy and that's okay. So accept the mess and give yourself permission to be like, that's fine because sometimes we're so busy comparing or we want to to look like the Pinterest, it's like most of us, our Pinterest fails as we're figuring it a lot, figuring it out. And so keep that in mind and keep your perspective. Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you sharing everything with us. Uh, I think people are going to love this one. Uh, thanks, Jason. So fun to hang out with you. Yeah, you too. All right. We'll, send, we'll go ahead and sign up. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.